next flashback is at Jin and Sun's wedding. <laughs> I like how Jin has to read his vows from a piece of paper that's like one sentence long. So Jacob happens to be there speaking perfect Korean and touches them both while giving them his blessing. Around 2001, Jack is pretty furious that he accidentally cut one of his patient's dural sacs, but what really grinds his gears is that a chocolate bar won't fall in the vending machine. We can see also that there's a made up candy bar named Lindo's in the vending machine, which is a tribute um, confirmed to be named in honor of uh, Damon Lindelof, one of the producers here. Jacob comes along, gets the Apollo bar, and they touch when he hands them the bar. Jack likes it. <laughs> and lastly, Hurley's flashback. Um, he gets released from prison, goes in a cab, and finds Jacob there, and assumes that he's one of the dead people that he can talk to. Jacob assures that he isn't one of them, and he tells him that what Hurley thinks is a curse could actually be a blessing. He tells him about Ajira Flight 316 and touches his shoulder on the way out. Okay, so if you've been somewhat conscious over the past couple of minutes while I've been talking about these flashbacks, it's pretty obvious uh, what the connection here is. Jacob shows up somewhere and touches each of the characters. Now the big question is, why did he touch them and what happens now since he did? Maybe Jacob knew about the loophole that his nemesis was going to create, so he literally touched the lives of the Oceanic Six and a few specific others like Jin so that they could play a key role in the upcoming war. Another idea that some people have that's a little more mystical is that when Jacob touches them, he's passing on part of his spirit, maybe part of his essence, uh, which protects them, maybe makes them special, so that when they all reunite in season six, maybe it leads to the reunification, maybe even the resurrection of Jacob from those spirits. Some people even think that when Jacob touches these people, he's actually giving them eternal life like Richard has, like Jacob himself has, at least it seems that way. Now we've seen themes of eternal life throughout the show. One of the examples is the Ankh symbol. It's the one that Tot Red is holding. It's the one that Paul is wearing as a necklace. It's a cross with the circle. That represents eternal life in the Egyptian culture. And there's a lot, a lot of ideas on why Jacob touched them out there, but I want to know what you guys think, so in the comment section I'll read them all. Let me know what you guys think about why he touched them. There's a couple other flashbacks, one with little Juliet, one with Alana, the mummy. Jacob visits Alana and asks her if she'll help him, and she accepts. It's probably to make sure Saeed goes on flight, uh, Ajira Flight 316. Okay, now I'm going to talk about what actually happened on the island in this episode, and I think I'm going to break it up into two parts. Uh, the first part being in the 1977 parts with um, Jack and the bomb and all that. And then the second part will be in 2007 with Locke and crew looking for Jacob. Okay, so 1977, Sawyer, Kate, and Juliet decide to try and stop Jack and crew from detonating the H-bomb. They go back to the island. They see Rose, Bernard, and Vincent. <laughs> it's funny here. You can see Sawyer has a dog treat in his hand when Vincent runs up to him. Hmm, how do you get that? Jack and Saeed get the core of the bomb, which I'm not sure why it's okay to be around now. If you remember in the Jughead episode, it was deemed dangerous because of the cracked case. So they blend in with the others, a gunfight breaks out, and Hurley's van saves the day, driving them away. Saeed gets shot. Jack and Sawyer share a brokeback moment, then a WWE moment, and then head to the construction site. Rosinski and crew are digging into the pocket of energy when Jack and friends infiltrate the site. After a gunfight, Jack drops the bomb core into the hole, but nothing happens. Suddenly, the sky makes a strange noise, and all these metallic objects start flying into the hole. The energy grows, and everything metallic gets swallowed into the hole, including a chain that wraps around Juliet's bod, <laughs> pulling her in. Somehow, she doesn't die. Uh, somehow, the bomb didn't explode by crashing hundreds of feet down, but Juliet happens to awaken down there and does a few falcon punches. Eight times to be exact with a rock, and boom, lost. Obviously, this screen is different from the normal white text, black background. It's inverted. The question is, why? There's a whole lot of ideas out there on what this could mean, but probably the most popular idea is that white is actually black, black is actually white, that whatever we thought was bad in the past is actually good, and vice versa. Maybe Jacob's actually bad, and his nemesis is actually good, the one trying to protect the island from Jacob. The word lost on the screen isn't actually black. Well, it's black in the sense of it, like a photo negative, an inversion really. So maybe it's implying that there's an inversion of some sorts in the upcoming season. And then another popular idea is that 
a white screen all season long has meant uh, a jump in time. So maybe when Juliet triggers the explosion, immediately they all jump in time. All right, now I'm going to talk about the 2007 timeline. That's the one with Locke, or fake Locke, Richard, um, Ilana, son, and friends. So Richard leads everyone towards the Four Toad statue where Jacob lives. Locke, or at least what we thought was Locke, convinces Ben to kill Jacob once they get there. And it's important to remember that Ben says his daughter told him to do whatever Locke asked him, and I'll talk about that at the end. Richard questions Locke coming back to life, saying that he's never seen anything like that before. Richard also claims that Jacob is the reason that he never ages. At the same time, we see Alana's crew carrying the giant crate and winding up at Jacob's cabin. When they get there, they see the ash surrounding the cabin has been disturbed, and she claims that Jacob isn't there, that somebody else has been using it, after entering the em empty cabin. And like I talked about at the beginning, she finds the cloth from the tapestry with Tauret on it. Uh, they burn the sucker afterwards. That is gonna burn. Locke's group finally gets to the statue and is surprised to find out that that's where Jacob lives. Ben and Locke enter as Locke gives Ben a knife to kill Jacob. Ilana's group later arrives to the statue and asks for Ricardus, Richard's true name, and asks him the secret question, what lies in the shadow of the statue? Richard answers, Ile qui nos omenes servibit, I think, which translates to, he, will, or he who will protect us or save us all. Happy with the answer, they reveal the contents of the crate, which turns out to be Locke's dead corpse. Do. Sun asks the obvious question, but wait, if that's Locke, then who's that other guy inside? Inside of Tauret, Jacob emerges and immediately recognizes the true identity of Locke's impersonator and says, well, I guess you found your loophole. The imposter replies that he had indeed and that Jacob had no idea what he had gone through to be there. Jacob tells Ben that no matter what he has been told, he still has a choice that he can simply leave so the two adversaries can discuss their issues. Ben asks Jacob about all the times he was neglected and ignored despite his faithful service and complains that Locke was a favored one, and also asks, what about me? Jacob only reply is, what about you? Oh, snap. After hearing this, Ben can't think of a proper comeback, so he resorts to violence and stabs Jacob twice. What about that, he should have said. <laughs> Jacob whispers to Locke's impersonator, they're coming, referring to the upcoming war in season six. The impersonator rolls Jacob into the fire pit in the center of the room, and Jacob burns like his cabin. He'll be okay. That is gonna burn. Okay, now over the next several minutes, I'm gonna be talking about Jacob's nemesis, obviously impersonating Locke ever since he got back on the island. Okay, I've heard and read hundreds and hundreds of ideas on who Jacob's nemesis could be, what he could be, what his purpose is, and these I'm gonna be talking about um, in the next several minutes are gonna be the ones that make the most sense to me. Um, first starting out with who he is. A lot of you guys have noticed the different colors between Jacob and his nemesis, with Jacob wearing the white and his nemesis wearing black. Jacob almost represents a Christ-like figure, right down to the fishing and healing, that someone has appointed as a divine entity or disciple. In the same way, Jacob's nemesis almost represents Satan. The conversation that Jacob and the man in black have at the beginning of the episode is almost exactly the same discussion that God had with the devil regarding humanity in the prologue to the book of Job. Also, in the book of Revelation, it's prophesied that the devil will be bound by chains prior to being set free to deceive humans shortly before the end of time. An idea people are saying is that Jacob's nemesis, and not Jacob, was the one previously imprisoned in the cabin by the surrounding perimeter of ash. Maybe the ash kept Jacob's nemesis in, but people could still go in the cabin, like how Locke and Ben were sta still able to visit the cabin and hear the nemesis in the man behind the curtain. After all, when Alana and crew arrive at the cabin, the very first thing they do is draw their guns, even before they realize the ash line was broken. And they only refer to it um, a he, maybe meaning the man in black. Remember how in other recaps I talked about the ash, how in other cultures, um, ash surrounding something is used to either keep bad spirits in or uh, keep them from going out. Maybe Horus was actually the nemesis in Locke's dream about him building the cabin. It could be that the nemesis used Horus' body, much like Locke's, to build the cabin, and then used Horus and Locke's dream to start Locke on the path that led him to moving the island and dying, which also led the nemesis to being able to use Locke as well. 
So back to the Satan comparisons, just as it talks about in the book of Revelation regarding the end of the world, Jacob could have let his enemy out of the cabin to roam the island and deceive the people, but his nemesis couldn't simply kill Jacob. In the Bible, the devil could not kill Jesus either to fulfill the prophecies, become a martyr, and the Christian savior of the human race. Humans had to kill Jesus. Jacob's nemesis deceives Ben into killing Jacob as like a Pontius Pilate figure in order to keep um, his hands out of it. Music